Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Today, we are on with Dr. Tolley for another wonderful, exciting episode of Ask the Vet. I cannot wait to see what questions we get today because they're all different and unique, right? Every time, every time, just like coming to the uh, the clinic, you know, every day, it's like, what am I going to see today, you know? And it's, there you uh, go. Yeah, hey, I have a question about that. So we're, we're in springtime, and... Do you notice a difference in your feathered clientele, like hormonally? Like, do you have to come in dressed as like a hockey goalkeeper sometimes because like you got birds that are thinking, hey, I need to be at home protecting my territory or I need to be making my nest. And here I am in this guy's office being examined. No. Any, any difference at all? <laughs> no, uh, it, it's uh, individual personalities uh, of the birds and, and how they're maintained. Um, but uh, do you know that the uh, over the years that the Amazons can get a little bit, uh, uh, male Amazons in particular, can get a little bit uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type uh, uh, personality. And it's, it's uh, I've had some interesting uh, situations where the bird has always been very uh, close to the owner and the cuddle and everything. And then the next thing you know, it's like... Uh, uh, biting a chunk out of the cheek and it's uh, like uh, in spring springtime you know spring is in the air but anyway no so every it's just um uh you know always something new always something coming in always a challenge always a challenge so last i think last time we met maybe you were you had some um students to take care of right some was it grading papers or um Try to remember yeah. what we do, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, that's exciting. Kind of see what the uh, up and coming um, vets are. Yes, doing. yes, it, it so is, much. and uh, they did uh, very well, and uh, and uh, have another class coming out in about no fifteen days or so uh, of new veterinarians, and hopefully some of them are going to be interested in the uh, uh, avian uh, and seeing avian patients, and we do have some some great young veterinarians that'll be coming out so excited about time. that but it's another year and getting close to summer so that's good there we go yeah the, they're fledging the next class is fledging the the uh, avian or the uh, veterinary school right uh, all right um are you ready for some questions oh <laughs> uh, bring them on bring them on it seems to go by quickly so so yeah. uh, let's see let's see what kind of uh, questions are esteemed uh webinar attendees have today okay all right so uh out the gate we've got from daniela about an eight-year-old pionis that has increasingly more frequent daily nasal discharge so it's clear and milky um i'm gonna sometimes clear and sometimes milky maybe um sneezing and head shaking for over two months and they tried a humidifier but it didn't work um they uh what they had done at the recent vet visit was the exam with lungs and air sacs sounded clear. They did a CBC and a, the chemistry is normal. Um, the quinal swab culture didn't uh, show any growth and they're still waiting for the nasal flush um, cytology uh, and uh, chlamydia tests. Um, but WBC was normal. So what could it be and what other diagnostics should they do? Well, I mean, if uh, if everybody was listening, they didn't leave much out. <laughs> no, they, they, they were doing everything. Um, and so, so you look at this and you say, well, we have uh, a pionus and we have a pionus that has, has a uh, nasal discharge. Okay, that's fairly obvious. And they say that it's, it's uh, clear to milky. Um, uh, there's another description that you, uh, you could look at thick and mucousy, or you could look at, um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, watery, uh, okay. Um, so we call it serous, uh, uh, nasal discharge, more of a watery, uh, nasal discharge. Um, and so <clears throat> sometimes the consistency, now we're getting down deep into nasal discharge here, the consistency of nasal discharge um uh, can kind of give you an idea of what what is occurring what we do know is we have these tests we have a, a a complete blood count cbc 
And that's going to look at the white blood cells. And what's the white blood cells? The white blood cells are the ones that you go, well, if they're increased, that shows inflammation. There's inflammation going on. And then also um, you say, well, what could cause inflammation? Well, a bacterial infection can cause inflammation. A fungal infection can cause inflammation. So, so if the uh, certain cell types, but the total white blood cell count is increased, then it would be uh, inflammation. And if you have uh, some type of uh, um, infection, or if you have a wound or you have inflammation that may be associated with a disease, then, uh, then it could be uh, elevated uh, and it, due to infection. So uh, here we have, well, you say, well, we have nasal discharge. That's a, that could be a bacterial infection. Well, we got this, the complete blood count back and what was it? Normal. So there's no inflammation going on there. Uh, it appears there could be, but it's just not showing up on the test. Uh, then they did a chemistry panel, I think. Uh, maybe not, but yeah. I don't, I don't think right. it's necessarily warranted because it's only only the, uh, the nasal uh, discharge. They did a, a culture and sensitivity and it was negative. So the uh, they did the chemistry. The chemistry was normal, and the um, the clinical swab culture didn't show any growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so what what there's one other thing that that could could uh, you know they they've been very good at at, at this uh, looking at it. Um, they can do a. Uh, actually a, a, a what we would say is an aspirate of the sinus <clears throat> in where you can inject some some uh, saline and then you can aspirate and that is the area right between this this area on the, the beak the nares and the middle of the eye and so the coena is 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 something that we do normally uh, culture if there is uh, uh, nasal discharge, but sometimes to uh, to really get in the sinus, you can you can actually uh, inject some saline, and it's it, and if you feel right there, there's a, a shallow depression between the eyes. So you're just going through skin, um, and then you're actually getting the material inside the sinus. So that's one thing that you could do. Uh, you can culture it. You could do cytology. I'm not sure that the cytology is going to show much when with it uh, from the beak on the exterior, maybe better on the interior, you may have a better chance of culturing something if it is in fact bacteria. The only other thing that you could look at is if there's something within the environment that is, is um, uh, actual something within the environment that's um, maybe irritating. The, the, the sinuses uh, itself, the sinus mucosa uh, causing this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's both sides, both nares, not just one, one side. Um, there's also, uh, it would be rare, but uh, something else is uh, uh, some type of a nasal tumor, but I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think that. Um, I would think more along the lines of a fungal, bacterial, um, or a, uh, uh, an irritant within the environment. So that's, that's where I'd go. How about that? Okay. Um, next question is from Frank. Uh, wants to know if LED light bulbs are um, okay to use around parrots, um, such as in the bird's room or living spaces where, where it spends a lot of time. Uh, do they flicker the way fluorescent or compact fluorescent bulbs do? So a little um, that is an excellent question. And I'm going to go with, I'm going to go out on a limb. Okay. Since we're, we're on a bird, we're on a bird webinar, right? So I'm going to go yeah. out on a limb. Okay. <laughs> a branch. A branch. <laughs> and say that they don't flicker. 
now somebody's going to go like, oh my God, what, what does he know? Um, but uh, so it's a light emitting diode, right? So I'm thinking that it's not like a fluorescent and it doesn't work um, in a similar fashion where you have this gas that's maybe causing the flickering. And I'm thinking that the light emitting diode, the LED is uh, kind of a, um, just a, a, it's not gonna flicker. It's just going to produce light. Okay, that's what I'm gonna say. You know, I may be wrong. Somebody's gonna say, what does he do? You know, but that's, I'm just kind of going with kind of uh, common sense, but uh, fact check me on that, please. Uh, but, and then, and then again, you're going like, well, if, if, what can I use? Because what can I buy? Because everything is LED right now, right? I guess you can, yeah, you know, fluorescent or LED, you know, so uh, that's what my thoughts are. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good um, question. I liked it. Yeah. Oh, well, I like them all, but, you know, there you go. All right. Amy wants to know, is there any uh, options other than Lupron or uh, Desilorin for hormonal parrots? Uh, there are, um, but um, none that uh, are um, what I would, I would uh, ex actually recommend. Uh, and I can't, and, and again, I can't think of them, of what some other options are right offhand. I know that uh, where there's been some discussion on some different, um, uh, I guess, therapeutic options uh, online uh, as far as just through, through email messages with some of my colleagues, because we're always looking for something. Um, but at the same time, um, usually there are a number of different uh, treatments uh, that may be applied to a particularly difficult problem that um, it takes a while for one to actually say that works um, and uh, where you don't have side effects or potential side effects or um, that it does what you want it to do. So uh, at this point, um, and, and, and I can tell you, Lupron or, or Desirelin, Desirelin implants for hormonal issues, that's woefully underachieving in many cases. And so I understand the question because I would like something better. I would like something that worked. Um, especially when some of these hormonal cockatoos with uh, cloacal prolapse, um, where we know that if we could go in and we could remove that ovary, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't occur. But um, unfortunately, the, cock the birds are built where it's, that is not a, a very, uh, and this is an understatement, easy procedure. Okay. So, yeah, so there's nothing uh, uh, that I'm aware of that has uh, <clears throat> that that you can recommend or that you have a lot of, uh, but the, there's any 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 kind of scientific basis that they'll be effective. So you're going to have, uh, and what we do is we have conferences. We go and we have um, abstracts we look at and 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 uh, different uh, continuing education opportunities where people say, I've tried this and it seemed to work on, on a <clears throat> little snowbell, the, the cockatoo. And I go back and I, I tried on Big Bob, the cockatoo or, you know, and, and it doesn't work or, uh, you know, and, and so uh, that's the advancement. That's why we, we continue to, we talk, we, we go to the conferences, we have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, publications uh, that, that get this information out. But what you're talking about, is, you know, is something that is a, 
arguably one of the most difficult presentations we have when we're dealing with hormonal issues in birds because we just don't have the uh, the therapeutics there yeah but we're continuing to advance and get better there you go so every meeting that we have of our avian veterinarians we can uh -huh. ask that yeah new things are coming exactly. up yeah all right um this message is from uh capri uh, they say thank you for your time for the session. Um, they want to know your opinion about their budgie, Yuki, little little guy here. He's two years old, weighs 34 grams, had an x-ray done, and the vet said there's a mass low in his body that could be an infected GI tract um, or a testicular tumor or an issue with his liver. So after a few days on oxygen with no improvement to his breathing, they discharged Yuki and sent me home, sent them home with Batril. And uh, is it theophylline filing to give um, Yuki orally? So mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions on how to? Well, um, uh, that's, so what, um, I have a 34 gram budgie, which is you know, for the most part, uh, kind of an average weight for budgies um and so what did he present as the could because it kind of started like uh had a uh, um a radiograph an x-ray and then there was a uh, mass in the in the intestinal tract and well it may not have been a mass it could have been something with the liver <clears throat> or a tumor, and, testicular tumor. A testicular tumor, and then they said liver, correct? Too. Yeah. It sounds like some breathing issues because they said after a few days in oxygen, <clears throat> no improvement to his breathing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, hence the the offlin, uh to try to increase his uh, uh, help his respiratory condition, um, and uh, well uh the the and how old was this budgie he's two, two, two. Years old. Hmm. Yeah. well um and so i guess what uh you you a couple of things uh with tumors budgies are um it doesn't matter what age and it doesn't matter what age in humans or what have you you have babies with cancer too um it's it's less likely um <clears throat> in a two-year-old budgie it's not an old budgie um but uh the uh, the 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 reason you're going to have respiratory difficulty and you're going to have uh, <clears throat> uh rapid uh respiration is uh, uh of course uh excitability if the budgie's excited or if it uh, has exercise if it's been flying around and it's going to to uh, uh, breathe uh, just because of uh, just uh, exercise and uh, intolerance and and not having and, and getting tired <clears throat> so that's one of the, the the reasons and then you say well he's always breathing he's breathing rapidly um, is this uh, something that's been going on or is it uh, uh, for a while and uh, is he eating? Is everything else uh, going well? Uh, that's all important information. So you bring him in and then, so what, what could it be? Well, uh, anytime uh, birds, uh, again, they have, they have the lungs and then the air sacs and, and their body, <clears throat> anything that is not um, an organ, a liver, a kidney, heart, um, intestinal tract, that anything in the body that's not that is usually air sacs, okay? And that's all part of the respiratory system, okay? And so if that's compromised, if there's a mass pushing up on that or fluid in the body that's, that's decreasing that capacity then it's going to have difficulty breathing okay um and that's uh, hence like usually with testicular tumors or renal tumors and in, in budgies that is a typical textbook where you have the bird is 
uh, lame. It has paralysis in one leg. It's perching on one leg. That's like the like one of the foundation um, <clears throat> clinical presentations in avian medicine. The budgie with one leg lameness, and that is that is usually a testicular, gonadal tumor, ovarian, or renal tumor. So the budgie appears to be maybe perching on both legs here. And so, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a problem, but also liver tumors are, are, are problematic in budgies. Uh, uh, and so <clears throat> if the liver's big, so you can palpate, you can feel just past the, the uh, keel bone, if there is an enlarged liver and uh, or enlargement there, um, you, you, you know, so that would be causing that that budgie to to breathe rapidly if there is uh, kind of a decrease in respiratory capacity. Um, and and uh, then then you get into uh, where you. You could, uh, that's where the inflammation comes in. If it's a bacterial infection, you have antibiotics and you have kind of bronchodilators to try to, I don't know, you know how effective that those, that, that'll be um, because we really don't know what's uh, going on uh, with the little budgie. Um, but it's uh, the oxygen, did it help? It was in two days in oxygen, and see, that's another thing. Oxygen isn't going to help if there's a, a respiratory capacity is compromised. Did it say it helped? Two uh, days off? No, it said that they're on it for a few days, but no improvement in the breathing. Yeah, so, so uh, that just is usually, uh, you know, sometimes it, it'll help a little bit, but um, uh if, if there's just not a lot of respiratory capacity, uh, then that's going to be problematic. Um, and so there's varying degrees of how much oxygen therapy will help. Um, and then, of course, you can have, we're talking about lungs and air sacs, but if you have something in your trachea, um, that could, that could uh, sometimes birds, if they get uh, seed caught in the trachea or something, they'll gape, they'll Mm. They're just trying to get air. So <clears throat> what you're seeing is, is often lower respiratory uh, kind of a situation, but it can range from anything from being excited uh, to being um, exertion can cause it. But, um, you know, that's a kind of a broad range of, um, uh, you know, things that you mentioned as far as the the uh, the body cavity from to, to testicular tumor to intestinal mass it's is something felt there but um, the other thing that you can look at is uh, a CBC you have to you know again on this bird it weighs 34 grams and you can only collect 0.3 mils of blood so it's not much but um, that may help determine if it is a a uh, an infl inflammation where you would be looking at maybe an infection uh, involved or not. So that's that's one of the things uh, that you're looking at, and then also palpation um, because um, that's about all you can do uh, because you're limited uh, when you have a th 34 gram budgie. I, I just had a 21 gram hamster, and so. <laughs> Uh, patient. And so it's limited. And guess what the hamster patient presented for, Laura? Uh, it was breathing rapidly. So, yeah. So we're limited on what we can do uh, with the, the smaller patients, but we can do something. Um, and uh, and so that's that's where I would say at this point you're looking at and what the possibilities are uh, on that. Okay. Yeah. Maybe too much time on the hamster wheel. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, 
All right, this question from uh, Susan, it's about a, a, a toy mishap. So this will, I don't know if you've had a toy mishap one in a while. So this is from Susan about African gray that got a link from a chain um, on a toy caught on his lower beak. So they took him to the vet to get it cut loose and decided to have a blood work and fecal test done. So mm -hmm. all was good, except the blood work showed metal toxin and slight white cell elevation. Um, could the metal from the chain cause that within 24 hours that it was on him? And um, they can't think of anything else that would have he would have been in contact with that could have caused that. Uh, he seems fine and normal now. And how long does metal stay in the system? Okay, well, that's a good, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, we just uh, pulled out uh, some, some fragments out of a bird with a magnet uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, the, the, the chain got caught around its beak, and I've, I've seen that, and it was cut. Um, most of the chain, unless it's zinc, uh, <clears throat> it, it could be zinc, um, is in, 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 in the birds eating it, um, uh, parts of it, the, it's not going to be toxic in, in the, in the bird. And, uh, um, in most cases, unless it's eating, uh, constantly this chain and i don't really know what what the the situation is well it's technically the link on the chain so i don't know if the link was part of the toy or if it yeah it yeah or somebody just had a chain and put it in the link, you know yeah. i mean it could have but it but uh nonetheless most of the uh, uh the chains on the toys um are kind of uh, stainless steel but let's just say uh it, it, when we do a test for um, uh, toxicity, we do, uh, you have to be very specific. The most common tests we do, you can do more, but the most common are zinc and lead. And we've talked about lead, is it, it has no nutritional value. Lead has, does not have any nutritional value. It's a toxin. We can tolerate a certain level, thank goodness but not much. Zinc is a nutrient. It's a micronutrient and uh, there's benefits for it. People, you know, and, you know, look, have zinc, but too much zinc, it can also cause issues. Most of the time we have issues with zinc is when there's ingestion of that zinc. Now, if this was just a chain, unless the bird was was actually uh, had something galvanized, or if this was a galvanized chain, that's where you have most of the leaching out in the water. Uh, they had uh, parrots at one time where the rain dry, uh, the dew would leach out on the on the wire cage, and the parrots would go up there and lick the dew drops with the zinc and they were getting elevated levels of zinc. So that's, that's possible. Most of the birds that we see that come in, um, in a, in a, in a kind of a pet setting, they, they ingest it. They, they tear off a, uh, die cast toy, you know, a metal toy or, or, or tear apart something that uh, they, they eat and, and they ingest it and it's in their body or pieces. Um, uh, so that's where that's, that's the case. So um, the, took the, uh, the chain off uh, of the beak and, uh, and they said that there was uh, evidence. So, uh, so the metal evidence there should be like what metal? you know, what, what, what was it? Because it's very specific. Is it zinc? Is it copper? Is it lead? You know, so we just don't say, well, it's a uh, metal toxicity, you know, that's that we just don't say that. Mm -hmm. And they don't test for that. They don't test for a general metal toxicity. Um, so that, that would be a question on that. Um, and then the other thing is how long do the pieces stay in the bird if they are in the bird? Well, you take radiographs 
um, uh, of the bird. Um, but you, you, you look and you see if there's any pieces in there because that would help determine what the next step of action is. Um, and if it's, like I said, if it's magnetic, sometimes you can, we did an in gluvotomy and we stuck a magnet into, you know, we placed a magnet down in through the stomach and we uh, very, one of the very, um, I guess, magnets that are heavy duty is small, but they actually are very strong, very strong magnets and, and got the, the metal. But if it's lead, uh, if it's copper, it's not going to pick it up and you have to look at possible surgery or flushing uh, with that. Um, but in, while it's in the, pro, in the ventriculus, it can stay for, for uh, days to weeks at a time. Um, depending on the size and the, and, and the consistency of that metal. So that's how long it can stay in there. If it's a, just imagine, I just trying to envision if, if it's just the, um, the link just hanging on the, like just stuck on the, on the beak where it's not necessarily ingested, but just like in the mouth area or, you know, in the, that's just that, a could that leach into the bloodstream, like to, or mm -mm. no. no. Okay. It's no. got to be like a bit ingested that's in like the GI. Yeah, it has to be ingested somehow, but it does give us the opportunity to talk about this uh, because it's very common, like I said, and, and, and you just don't realize those birds are always thinking about doing that. I mean, people have that with everybody that has the birds know that how, how inquisitive and, and, and they'll, the next thing you know, they're, they're ingesting something like that. And not all birds do it naturally, but but some do, and uh, and uh, this this bird that you know I'm, I, I, that we used a magnet on uh, didn't even you know wasn't even come in for, did come in for that it actually came in for something else and the the radiograph like whoa look at wow. look, look you know and, and, and that happens with dogs too I I know that they do something the dogs have all this money and. Or, you know, on a bird, bird side, what, you know, what eats money are ducks and geese. And yeah, yeah, a lot of coinage. Something yeah. shiny, right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, it takes some time. And sometimes with the larger birds, we can go in with a, a flexible scope and just pull, you know, retrieve it. Uh, because we can get a, a grasper down there and start and just retrieve that. But with... Of course, when you have a 200 gram bird, you can't put a flexible endoscope down there and we have to, we have to do what we can. And those, those particulate, the, that metal can be very, very little. And when I say it a radiograph, I wanna to mention to everybody that, you know, an X-ray is good if you, have, if you have particulate or metal pieces in the stomach. It lights up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> but the bird could have eaten uh, a lead, uh, uh, you know, sinker. And I think I've showed this before where the, you can oh, actually yeah. see the, the bird pieces and different things. And, uh, but you have to get a blood level and you have to be specific, but those uh, diagnostic labs are specific for it. But if it's just uh, the, the link caught in it and I've seen it and different yeah. things, just different rings caught in bird beaks over the years, it's not gonna leach into the blood and you have a wound and you take it off and whoop, there it goes, it's done. All right. It's like having a piercing like they're trying to look cool. Yes, exactly. All right. Um, so a question from Brad, uh, uh, another great question. This one, uh, Congo Af a two-year-old Congo African gray that got sick April 6th. Uh, they rushed him to the vet and he tested positive for, okay, I hope I kill this word, anti-gangliocide and a crop infection. So he was given antibiotics and anti-inflammation um, meds for 21-day cycle. Uh since he has since recovered and will have a second anti-gangliocide uh, May 1st. So getting time with the vet to understand a positive anti 
gangliosai test has proved difficult. So can you tell me what the test means? They want to know if you could tell them what the test means. Can you explain? I, I want to know myself. You do? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what an anti-gangliosai test is. Uh, thank you for the question, but can't help you. Okay. And I'm going to make sure I said it correctly. So it's not somewhere. No, you, it sounds it, like anti-gangliosai. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's a great question. Thank you very much, but I have no clue. Okay. No. So for that, there we go. Um, so, yeah. Uh, someone, someone made a comment going back to the LED lights. They, um, they said that they uh, LEDs uh, they do flicker, but much less so than fluorescents, and that you can actually buy flicker-free uh, LEDs, but they're hard to find. So you got to really look for them if you want to. If you want to order. Them. I. And, and I don't think it's going to matter that much. Uh, I, you know, I, I would say that, uh, but thank you so much for the, uh, the information. Learn yeah, something every day. <laughs> so, so with that, I would recommend, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that uh, the LED would be better than the um, fluorescence. Than the fluorescent, yeah. But thank you. Yes, that's great. All right, and then someone wants to know: Can you palpate a uh, palpitate a budgie for kidney tumor, like a like a liver tumor, or is it too close to the spine? So, yeah, that's 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 good. The the <clears throat> now there's a little here's the here's the key, uh, and it, it's it, it's dependent upon the size, right? It's dependent upon the size of the tumor and the ability of the bird to live with the tumor. Uh, but the kidneys are kind of in, in what, like kind of fossa, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of within the sensacrum and up on and the right up against the, the, uh, the spinal cord uh, column, the vertebral, the, the backbone. And so uh, they're way up there. And then you have the keel bone that uh, in the sternum, basically, the keel goes, goes really far back. Um, and then, uh, so there's not a, you don't have a lot of laxity in there, but you do have enough because the liver is right, really at the, the base of that, that, that keel. Uh, and so that's why we could, if it's enlarged, we can feel that. But with renal tumors or gonadal tumors, uh, no, it would be extremely difficult because of the location of those uh, kidneys and the, and the uh, testicle and the uh, ovaries. Yeah. Okay. And they're in, in you know, some, quite often they're very difficult to, to actually observe uh, on radiographs if you have tumors. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean uh, for budgies, um, as far as renal or gonadal tumors are concerned. Sometimes it's it's difficult because of their size. Uh, you need uh, extremely good uh, equipment uh, for such a small patient, and uh, and and also very good technique so that you can get a delineation between the anatomic structures within that bird. So is it hard, is it more challenging to um, palpate a tiny budgie compared to like a macaw or a cockatoo? Is it, is your body sizes? Uh, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good, you know, I've never really thought about it, um, but you can palpate enlarged livers on budgies. You can palpate enlarged sea loams. You can palpate the eggs. I would, I would say that um, it's very similar. You know, it's just different size uh, on that. Um, but you, what you can feel in the budgie, you can feel in the macaw or um, uh, on that, yeah. But you know that that sea loam is a little bit different uh, when you start getting into chickens and ducks and bigger birds like that. But as far as the 
the uh, kind of the citizens, you know, it's it's kind of similar. Uh, but anyway, good question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. So we got a question from Stephen. Um, and it's similar to the Pionis question we had earlier. Uh, they have a military macaw that who's developed congestion, sneezing, and a slight nasal discharge um, at this time of year. Um, when this originally was observed, he was checked with cultures, CT scan, and, and a scope with no cause found. So since this, he continues to occur each year about the same time, and they're wondering if it's seasonal allergies and if the um, and their treatment, if that might be a cause. So can birds have seasonal allergies? Is one I'm curious about that too. You know, and and so my question on that is why can't they? You know, why why not? You know, is there something like uh, birds don't have seasonal allergies? Well, what I would do is I would get with the uh, National Institutes of Health and figure out why birds don't have seasonal <laughs> allergies so we can do something to help us, right? So uh, there's, uh, you know, there was a question that we had um, uh, at one time we did research, uh, you know, to some projects because we were looking at feather picking. And so you have seasonal allergies, you have feather, uh, excuse me, feather destructive behavior, uh, forgive me, but I'll, I'll, you know, I have a tendency to go back to the old days and say feather picking, but feather destructive behavior. And so why uh, is that in, and that was when uh, I said, well, let's, let's do skin testing on these birds. Let's try skin testing. And I, I wasn't the only, there was a, a number of people looking at that, but we were working with a, as a team of uh, veterinary scientists to, to try to figure out if you could do skin testing on birds and see if birds have, have a uh, kind of a uh, hypersensitivity. Okay. Uh, kind of an inflammatory response. And, <clears throat> And because uh, there was a question like, just like this, like, uh, well, birds can't get it. You know, birds don't have that type of response. And um, so what we did, what we did find is that birds, unfortunately, because of their, the feathering, you can't do a hypersensitivity reaction and pluck feathers before you do it <laughs> because that would kind of um, uh, make uh, a problematic in reading right uh, so you had to try to find an area that was um, uh, you know kind of where there weren't a lot of feathers and and uh, and and do the skin testing so there's just not enough room and we get back to the budget you know, you know not that we have budgies uh, with this, but uh, there's only enough for maybe one or two injections. But, but nonetheless, so what we found is that, uh, and we had pathologists say birds do have have all evidence of kind of a hypersensitivity pathology that would be described in other animals. So the uh, so. With the question, yes, and we see this um, in, a, in, in some of our, our patients over the years where every year something would occur at, at, at a certain part of the year. And I don't think it, it, it's dealing with the, the place of the sun in the sky, okay, or the length of day, uh, you know, that, that would cause this reaction. So, uh, I would say that uh, it is uh, um, extremely possible that, that the bird is, is uh, reacting to something within the environment that it's sensitive to. Yes. I know that, uh, I mean, they say that uh, like old world species and new world species, they could, the, the, the ones that have a lot of dander can irri possibly inter uh, irritate the, the new world species. Is that... Kind of yeah, I've heard that too. I ha I've heard that too. So, and and <clears throat> I have no evidence to to back that up, other than if, you know somebody could say, "Well, Dr. Tully, I you don't have any evidence, but I do because <laughs> I had this bird and it was like had all of these problems and you know kind of there was hypersensitivity issues or what have you, and I moved it and what." Voila, it, it, you know, it, it was fixed. 
<laughs> like your dusty cockatoo sitting, sitting in the cage next to your like Amazon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, and we've had that. But that's an excellent question. Yes. Yes. But okay. uh, yeah. We had right. to get first over. Yes, birds can have hypersensitivity reactions. Yes, yes. All right, there you go. Uh, so Elizabeth, another question about African gray. This one's from Elizabeth, a 10 year old gray. Uh, they went to San Antonio on an emergency uh, for a three day, for th went to San Antonio for an emergency for a, a three days and came back and, oh, I'm sorry. They, it sounds like they left town for three days. They came back and uh, Pepper, their gray was plucked on, his feathers on his right side. Won't let the flight feathers grow back. And he's molted regular feathers, but the other side hasn't grown back yet. Will they still grow? So I guess some uh, the gray plucked feathers off of their uh, their right side and they wanna know if it's, uh, are they gonna grow back? And Well, um, <clears throat> the, they, I, okay. When, when you pluck the feather, um, that uh, you could, you, you can uh, disrupt the blood supply, the, uh, the, the germinal uh, tissue in that, that base of that feather. Um, and it can uh, cause it not to, you know, there's always the potential when you pluck a feather, it will not regrow. Okay, there could damage that that base of that feather, so there's that possibility um, on on something like this um, where you <clears throat> pluck uh, you know all, all of these feathers and they all don't regrow. Then that's um, it just uh, you know there's there's a couple of things and it could be that there's something within that area that was affected uh, that relates to the developing feather that uh, they will not grow uh, back. Um, it, it would be hard for me to believe that with the number of feathers that I've plucked uh, for different reasons, blood feathers, different things like that, uh, destructive feathers that that needed to be plucked, that regrew, uh, <clears throat> that 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 many feathers would just due to the plucking uh, part of disrupted all of that germinal growth to to get that feather to to uh, tissue down there would be like we're not regrowing, we're not regrowing, you know, every one of them. So. <clears throat> So the other the other issue is that the possibility of um, that the birds plucking those feathers as they're growing and keeping them plucked in that area, and you never see it. You, you say, "Well, I've never seen them pluck the feathers," but they are good at doing things when you're not watching, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and. Uh, uh, I remember uh, uh, that uh, that you know you put a camera on them and you, you can see them do. Uh, we had our our uh, I think a, a dermatologist say about a, an e collar. You know, Tom, we need to put an e collar on that bird. And I said, Oh, Sandy, I don't think it's yeah, you know that e collar is gonna you know gonna stress the bird. Don't want to do that. I said. Uh, Let's not do it. She says, well, that's not going to heal. That wound's not going to heal that bird. I said, I haven't seen that bird. Yeah. Well, two days later, somebody kind of looked through the window when the bird didn't know it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're good at doing that. So that's, that's the possibility. What I'd like to say is that you have birds that have had feather destructive behavior and have plucked their feathers out. And they've been uh, kind of featherless for a period of time. And you go like, those birds will never regrow their feathers. Well, they have. I, I've seen cases where birds have been uh, kind of pl plucked 
and you'd say they'll never grow those feathers back and they they do not all of them uh do that but uh i, I don't see exactly why this bird would not grow the feathers back at that part uh, unless it's doing it itself when you're not watching and keeping that and there's something is in that area or there there was something disruptive um, uh, in that uh, but the only way you can look at that is uh, is just with all feather destructive behavior cases is make sure that all of the the tests, you know, especially your complete blood count, your chemistry panel, everything that you can measure, uh, you know, and it's not a lot, but a, a few things to make sure the bird is healthy and that there's nothing in particular there. Um, and then, uh, then, then uh, go from there. There's always the biopsy too uh that uh you can look at and i'm just giving you some options like well there's not much you can do yeah you can keep going to try to investigate it but um that's uh the, the you know as far as the uh, looking at microscopic to look at it yeah okay um i like this this next question i think I don't know if we've gotten this one before, but uh, this is intriguing. Elizabeth, wa Elizabeth wants to know, is rubbing a parrot's feet as acceptable as scratching his head? So is could that be a possible hormonal trigger? Is that okay to do if you're kind of massaging your bird's feet? Well, I, <clears throat> you, you, uh, you know, you, you go into the hormonal trigger, I, you know, the the one thing that I want to say is that we have the birds to enjoy. Uh, it, it's it's one of those things that you know you have the pendulum. You know, you know, pendulum goes one way. Well, don't get too close to your birds. Well, there's certain things, but I I think that you know rubbing the birds' feet or or you know I'll get my little cynical out and I'll pet it you know and then you know rub its head and you know, talk, you know, sweet nothings in its ear, you know, but it's like, um, I, I don't think that there's any, any, uh, um, uh, problems. I think that the hormonal is if you, you start getting and rubbing near the tail or letting the bird, um, you know, uh, no, for the lack of a better word, masturbate uh you know uh around or near you uh that is uh um that is going to increase that uh yeah you know hormonal uh, behavior in that the behavioral aspect that lead to uh some of these uh issues and in particular cockatomas you know those birds that like to get that, that, and I use that term from Chris Davis. That's where I first heard it, that they want to become physically attached to you like a tumor. Cockatoma. Chris Davis, I, I, I'm giving her all the credit, but I, I'll never forget that. I said, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, those are the ones that you really have to be, be careful with. Yeah. Okay. But okay. for the feet or the head, you know, I mean, yeah. There you no. go. Uh, and we do, you know, you have maybe some some nail filing, so that that's also touching your mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Very um, good. All right. So here's a question. Um, Fanton wants to know: Are salt lamps okay to use near bird cages in a room? You know what the salt lamps are? Yes, yes, yes. Himalayan salt lamps. Um, yeah, uh, and I'm sure some other places too. But uh, I. I haven't heard any any issues with that, and I wouldn't I wouldn't suspect that there would be any any problems there. What if the bird was to go up and like take a try to eat it or lick it or something? <laughs> um, curious bird, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, you know, you'd want to uh, make sure that it's it's uh, observed. I, I'm thinking the bird would be uh, in the uh, in the cage in the cage uh, but if he's out if the bird is out and has access then you'd want to 
to uh, watch it. But I'm a firm believer, uh, no matter what the literature says, that birds have excellent taste and um, that, uh, that they, they, you know, but they may have a taste for the salt. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend that they, uh, they uh, start chewing on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, if, I don't know if it's reflective or not, if they can see their, yeah. their you know, the one thing is, is if, if it's, you know, soft, I haven't really felt it. I mean, they, they would tear it up, but as long as they didn't ingest it, but you would know, right. I'm yeah. sure they could go through a salt lamp, you know, a large parrot and they can sculpture off. it themselves. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. A little chainsaw on there. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so beware. They could be in the cage with them, but you know, don't let them play with the salt lamp or chew it. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Who knew? I know, right? There's, yeah. yeah there's, but I knew what it was. So there you go. There you go. That's right. Um, the, the alternative lamps would be salt lamp and I don't know, uh, maybe one of those lava lamps, which you definitely wouldn't want your bird. No, <laughs> no. Lava lamp, right? no, no. Those are hot. Those are. Those are exactly yeah. and wax in there. Yeah. All right. So that, <laughs> believe it or not, that's all the time we have for questions today. We kind of breezed right through those. Um, a lot what? of great questions, like a lot of African and Pionis. What about there. a what about a short one? Is there a short one? A short um, one? Let's see. Let's see if we can. The powers. Oh, there is no short one. Huh. Okay. Huh. Yeah. I guess. Not a yes or a no. As a, it's a. I guess they're, they're ones that are a little bit, uh, okay, here's one, here's a personal question for you from me is my, my little budgie guy. I don't know if it's just this time of year, but it's the funniest thing. If I, I eat oatmeal in the morning and when he sees me eating oatmeal, he like tries to land on my lip and eat the, like, he wants me to regurg, like he knows the oatmeal is kind of like, it's just bizarre. Like, yeah, uh -huh. I have to like, I have to like kind of put him back in his cage. Cause it's yeah. like this time of year, right? Is it, is it a hormonal thing? Cause yeah. He's like flying out my mouth. Yes, I, 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 um, uh, I see love in the air in my budgie cage too. So, yes, I think it is uh, the time of the the year. I, I do, I do. Uh, I, you know, I notice it, and the the budgies seem to be a little bit more active. I don't know uh, the lighting or whatever, you know, yeah. but. Uh, uh, love is in the air in my budgie uh and and, and i have three uh so you know <laughs> so there you go and so it's only this time of year that he does that or, huh. okay wait we do actually have let me see if we have time for this question okay um do you recommend separating a male cockatiel from the flock when he has decided that he is in charge and being very obnoxious <laughs> to the rest who are all pretty calm and self-secure so you got a bud you got a cockatiel bully in the cage with him. yeah get the bully out of there you know put him in his own cage and let him think about it you know you know i okay. mean if it, it, you know it, again if it, it, it's a situation seriously if it's a situation where there's uh the possibility of uh having some injury and, and stressing out the other birds then um then I think that it's, uh, and this goes for, you know, uh, any of the uh, birds you have, uh, if it's not compatible, remember these are all uh, arranged. Uh, just think if somebody started coming and putting people in your house yeah. and say, <laughs> you know, hey, you got to live with this person. You got to live with this person. You go like, oh my God, but they go, but they look like you, they, you know, <laughs> Yeah. You, you know, know we, just, we just read an article. I just put po we posted an article on lefebvre.com about a study on Quaker parrot, like monk parakeets, Quaker parrots. Um, yeah. Where they they the researchers they took the ones that were the most obnoxious in the flock, the ones that were the most aggressive, and removed them for like eight days, and then brought them back in. And when they brought them back in, the other birds were less like they weren't bullied by them as much. Like they they kind of like. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, no, we're not, we're not putting up with this again. So kind of mm -hmm. put them in their place. Yeah. It's an interesting article if you have a chance. But it, 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 and it is, and it is. And, and what I would like to see is time, how that would go over time. Yeah, you I see, if, 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 if that, you know, when they initially put them back in, they didn't, 
but how far out did they look at it to see if it if took them that much yeah. time to reestablish and they ended up back at the top. But anyway, That's always fun. Right. Right. Always right. fun. Great. It is, Great right? Everybody. Um, yes. So I have a couple. So I wanted to uh, announce our giveaway winner today before I forget. And that is uh, Elizabeth Martinez. Congratulations. You're going to be getting sent a um, bag of the, the fever pellets as well as another product of your choice. Um, so congratulations. And then I also wanted to uh, give a sneak peek of what we have next Friday, which is we'll be on with uh, another um, episode of The Gray Way with uh, Lisa Bono. And she's going to be giving us uh, tips and tricks for blinging out the cage. So if your bird's cage is due for a makeover or if you want to reimagine the cage, make it spectacular for your bird, tune in next Friday. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and Laura, I want to thank all of our attendees to the webinar and with fantastic questions. Um, sorry about that anti-ganglioside test. I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll continue to uh, look and see what that uh, is. I, I have an idea, just not, not familiar with that uh, uh, on that, but uh, the LED, how about that? We had yep. a lot of budgie, uh, um, a lot of budgie questions and, and things. So thank, thank everybody. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and everyone, uh, everyone obviously appreciates your time here. So, all right. Oh, it's, fun. it's fun. On that note, I'm going to wish everyone a fabulous weekend and I can't wait to our next episode of Ask the Vet. So until well. next time. Thank you, Laura. Take care. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everyone have a great weekend. Stay safe and all the best to you and your flock.